Welcome. We're so glad to have you here for the second forum for our Project Green Garden Forums this spring. And I think we're in for just a very good day. Uh, I, I have a few announcements and I'll try to make them brief because I know we're all excited to hear Kelly. Uh, first of all, our, our Master Gardeners, the Johnson County Master Gardeners, are going to be having a sale on May 15th. And this garden sale is going to incorporate more than just the perennials and the, the standard plants that we ordinarily think of being for sale at a plant sale. They also sell garden, are looking for garden art and uh, different, different things that you might use in the garden, utensils, things that are clean and ready to, ready to use. So they also, they, what I'm saying is that I would like for you to think about whether you have something you'd like to donate to the sale for, for the Master Gardeners. And then also think about whether you'd like to go and buy something from the sale on the 15th of May. Think about the old uh, orange tree that has uh, been around for a long time and you really are tired of taking care of it or, or uh, the house plants. They love house plants. So, so maybe um, uh, something that you've, that you've enjoyed and you're ready to pass on. Uh, so, and also consider going to the sale to pick up something new and fresh for yourself and also then benefit the Master Gardeners. I'd like to first thank uh, Beth Fisher and the <coughs> library staff for all that they do to make this possible. Project Green works together with the library in partnership and it's a wonderful partnership. And Beth works hard to coordinate all of this audiovisual stuff, so it's great. We'd like to thank the Project Green cookie bakers and volunteers, uh, Diane Allen, Cindy Parsons, Jean Dobbins, Janet Moss, Becky Gelman, and Linda Meredith. Uh, Cindy Parsons has brought us in our, some wonderful uh, gifts for door prizes that we're going to give away later on, and so I thank her for doing that. And we have somebody new and special on our uh, volunteer list this year, and that's Becky Gelman. And Becky is walking up the center aisle, <laughs> handing, out, handing out handouts. Um, Becky has made this job so much easier for me. She comes early, she gets the coffee started, she gets, <laughs> she gets the tablecloths on the tables, she gets it all set up, and uh, she does communicating with our speaker before uh, the forum takes place. And so she has been a, she's a wonderful help and a good worker, and we surely appreciate what she does. As most of you know, the papers and pencils that you found on your chairs are for use uh, during uh, the presentation, you may have ideas or uh, questions you want to write down that you want to remember for later for the question and answer period. And uh, the, our problem is we can't, we can't take questions from the audience because we do have our television audience at home and they are not able to hear you when you ask your questions from the audience. So we ask you to write them down and we will collect those um, at the, uh, when we have our refreshment period. We have some dates to remember. May 8th is the Project Green Garden Fair, which will take place at the Carver Hawkeye Arena from 9 o'clock until 11.30. On July 11th, from 10 to 3, the Project Green Garden Tour will take place. And this year, we're going to revisit the garden of Dick and Marty Shepherdson. Any of you who have met, visited that before will know that they have, they have wonderful ponds and, and streams and plants, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful garden, and, and it's a joy to be able to go back and visit it. Holly Carver and Lane Adkin Arts Garden is on the tour this year. Susan Craig's garden is on the tour, as is Michael Linsing's. This is going to be a, just a really fun tour. So, jot uh, down July 11th. And the way we run these, uh, our garden tours, if you can just get to one <coughs> of the gardens, every garden is going to have a ticket that will tell you where all the other gardens are. Um, and so you pay for your ticket at the first garden that you attend, and that's, that's up to you. There'll be a lot of publicity out to give you um, ideas of where these gardens are, and you can also check the Project Green website, which is uh, projectgreen.org, and that will give you all the information you need to know about that. On April 11th, we will have our last forum for the spring, and that will be, take place here at 2 o'clock on a Sunday. Um, this is a sponsored, this is a little bit different than our usual forum. It's sponsored by Eco Iowa City. And um, it, will be, it will feature uh, Bob Henriksen from Nebraska. Um, he is with the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum, and he is going to be a wonderful speaker, and so I encourage you to come. I was lucky enough to visit the gardens in Nebraska with a bus tour last spring, and he took us through the garden and, and told us about the plants. 
And this man has a lot of enthusiasm and a love for his plants. What they do with these, the, the, the name of his, his presentation is Great Plants for the Great Plains. And this whole Great Plants for the Great Plains program is one where they are um, trying to find the plants that we're missing, that are good plants for your garden, not mundane plants that people are going to pass by so much. What, that's going to really add something to your garden, but these, the nice thing about these plants is they don't require extra fertilization, extra water, um, and extra keep. They're, they're very, um, they, they thrive and they're very hardy plants. But you'll see, and he's, he'll have his PowerPoint presentation next time, you'll see that, that that doesn't mean they're not really neat. They're wonderful. And we were very impressed with these plants. And then they give plants, plant awards each year for the best plant um, in each of several categories. So uh, you'll really um, be glad, I think, to hear him speak. He's going to be really good. Uh, I want you to realize that we're going to have a sign up for our uh, door prizes, and not now, but obviously, but uh, at, the, at, re at the refreshment time. And that will take place at the, at the table in the back of the room. So when we break for refreshments, if you want to have a chance at getting a door prize, prize please go back there and sign up for it. Sorry. You know, when we recruit uh, speakers for these forums, we look for someone who's going to be enthusiastic and fun to listen to. And then on the other hand, we want someone who's going to give us a lot of good information, you know, something we can take home and use in our gardens. Sometimes we're a little heavy on the enthusiasm, and we have to really look for that information. And then sometimes we have a whole lot of information, and we'd like to just get a little bit more enthusiasm. <laughs> well, I think today we've got them both. Um, I was so excited this morning when I was looking at Kelly Norris's website. And let me ask you, for those of you with computers, and I mean most of you probably have them, go home and Google Kelly Norris, even after you've heard him speak, because he's got a great website that is loaded with information. Uh, <clears throat> Kelly is steeped in horticulture. He manages Rainbow Iris Farm, a seven-acre nursery in Bedford. He's working on his master's at Iowa State studying woody plants. He's written two books. One of them was for sale, and I'm sure you can sign up for more um, later, right? Okay, he'll explain more about that probably. Uh, he is on the board of directors for the Iowa State Horticulture Society and working like mad on the All Iowa Horticulture Exposition 2, which is going to take place in Atumwa on March 19th and 20th, something you might want to consider. He keeps a full speaking schedule and, this, as I said, a website that's loaded with information. He has a lecture, a lecture called Zone Worthy on his website, or part of it anyway, that is just wonderful. I just can't say enough about this guy, and I'd better be quiet because I know you want to hear him. So I'll, let, I'll introduce Kelly Norris. Thank you so much. Am I on? We're good? All right. Well, it is an absolute pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. Um, I, I love coming out and speaking to garden groups. Uh, I, I have the, the opportunity to do it um, all over the country these days, and so it's always fun to sort of, you know, do a group uh, that's, that's here, in, here in the state uh, and here in the Iowa City area. This is, uh, this is a lot of fun, and we have a full room, so I'm hoping we have a great, great time today. A couple of plugs. This is the sort of the PR per por portion of the talk. All of you should have received a green trifold on your chair for the All Iowa Horticulture Exposition coming up on March 19th and 20th in Ottumwa. Uh, yours truly is co-chair of the event, and you should all attend, uh, because it is going to be sort of the, we, we, we market it as being sort of a gala exhibition of horticulture. We have what we think is a really phenomenal lineup of speakers. Dan Himes from Terranova Nursery will be with us on Saturday, and Stephanie Cohen, uh, the author of several books on garden design, will be with us on Friday afternoon for our, our two keynote sessions, too. So if you have any questions at any point about that, we'll have plenty of time, I think, today to talk and get to know each other so uh, we would love to have you down uh, uh, for the expo in just a couple of weeks the other thing as she mentioned is I, I I had copies I have one copy left of my my first book which is the Iowa gardeners travel guide it's a travel guide to Iowa's public gardens and nurseries greenhouses places that you can buy and see plants all over the state I was in Mount Pleasant for a master gardener conference yesterday and I brought along two cases and I thought 
will be good. And I, I started the day here with seven copies, and there's one left. So, but you can buy them on my website, which is at the top of your handout, too. So if you, you didn't get here uh, and get one uh, uh, before, they, before they went out, I've, like I said, I've got one more that someone can uh, get if they'd like. You can get it online uh, as well. So, the Four Season Garden. Have you ever thought of your garden as a calendar? The calendar garden. In fact, in Iowa, we are so privileged, you might say, to experience something as wonderful as the change of the seasons. I was joking as, we were, as my, my friends and I were walking here that Iowa is fortunate to have four seasons and occasionally a fifth one, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and hell. <laughs> and hell comes around about twice a year, about three weeks ago when we were so up to here with snow and ice and frigid temperatures that we could hardly stand it. And then usually about the fourth week in July when we wilt at the thought of going to get the paper in the morning. So, but that aside, actually, I, I, I do like to think of the seasons as five seasons, really, particularly here in the Midwest. You'll find that this talk could be given, you know, we could, we could go anywhere and give this talk. We could go do, because, because for most of the country, mo you know, the majority of the country is fortunate to experience some kind of change of seasons. And I, I hope what I can do in the hour of time that we have together today and then the discussion time that follows after that is, is train your mind and your eyes to see that the change of the seasons is really all up to us. That it's really all about how we perceive the garden and how we build and structure the garden in a way that reflects our passion for gardening and in a way that shows that timepiece of the seasons, that calendar of the seasons. So in my head, this is how I think of it. So, you know, it's a four season garden, but it's in my mind almost broken up into five pieces. Winter and early spring, which is hopefully what we're in right now. Um, spring coming up, two phases of summer, early summer and what, what, was, what some of the great garden writers of the 20th century called high summer, which would be uh, that period of the return of hell in about late July and early August. That's high summer in the garden, so uh, oftentimes best spent looking out at the garden and maybe not so much being in the garden. And then autumn, which is so wonderful. So you may ask, you know, the, the the comment or the question you may come to the room with today is, you know, what is a four season garden? How do I make a four season garden? How do I take my current garden and make it a four season garden? And I used to approach this talk in that way. I used to sort of build this on a season by season basis as to how you could make a four season garden. But the fact is, is that most of us maybe don't have four season gardens, but we've got probably three season gardens. We have an innate understanding of what it means to, to progress through the seasons. We're surrounded by it in our culture, particularly here in the Midwest, with, having, with living around you know, such a great amount of agriculture and sort of witnessing you know, the planting in the spring, you know, the growing season in the summer, and that ritualistic harvest in the fall. And so you know, I, I actually revamped this entire talk just for you folks today. I finished the slide list that you're holding at 1 a.m. this morning. Um, so <laughs> nothing like just tweaking right up until the last minute, right? And so I have kind of a central philosophy as to how I approach gardening. And I think I'm going to give you a plug for if you, if you can be here next month for next month's speaker, you're in for an absolute treat. Bob Henriksen is a really good friend of mine. And, and we may even talk about some of the same kinds of plants, though you'll definitely want to hear him talk because he's, he's, he's fabulous. He's really phenomenal. And at the heart of uh, maybe our mutual philosophies is, is a concept that I call zone worthy. And it's that we in this country need to stop gardening with plants that just simply survive, that are maybe mundane, as Melanie says, and instead garden with those that thrive. What an expectation. What a concept. We should, we, we, that we should expect, much, much so more so, demand plants that we can plant and that we can reap rewards from for however long they choose to do so, preferably more than a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, our horticulture industry historically has not always, you know, supported that concept. Plantsmanship is often regarded as kind of a peripheral nerd science. It's something that goofy people like yours truly does. But in fact, all of us have an innate appreciation for what we want our garden to be. We don't want a Xerox copy of the garden next door. We want a garden that expresses us, right? We want a garden that looks like us, it feels like us. And that's what's so wonderful about this whole philosophy. And I hope that you'll agree by the end of the time together today. 
So I, I say that a four-season garden starts with zone-worthy plants. And you may ask, okay, so what is zone-worthy? And by my definition, the way I define it when I do, I, I write a column called Zone-Worthy for Iowa Gardening Magazine that just debuted with the January issue. You may have seen it if you, if you subscribe to that magazine, too. I talk about it obsessively on my website. I have a whole lecture on the website that I do called Zone Worthy, and I have it posted on the website so you can look through and see that. I call it a sustainable movement. Gosh, don't we hear that word a lot these days, almost to the point of being cliche, and I don't want to make it cliche, but the fact is is that Zone Worthy plants, those that truly thrive, are kind of the very essence of a sustainable idea. And if you think about it, when you have a collection of plants that's put together, centered around the central idea, centered around the central idea, <laughs> centered on the idea that they thrive instead of survive, you can imagine that a four-season garden can come together rather quickly because if we appreciate plants that do their stuff throughout a variety of seasons, we can truly create a dynamic space that's worth engaging in. And that's my idea of a garden, and I hope it is. I would imagine that it maybe is for you as well. So it certainly embodies a plant-driven spirit. Four words that come to mind that we may use in our time together today or that you may have heard me use already are ideas like thrive, that plants should thrive, that our garden should reflect our passion, that they should be ecologically conscious, that we should no longer think of our gardens as a place beyond the environment around, around us. And I, I don't mean that, that by that suggestion that defines a particular look. It has in the, history, in the last you know, 50 or so years of talking about you know, prairie style concepts and ecologically good garden designs, it's tended to sort of focus on that prairie style concept. And I don't necessarily think it has to at all. I'm simply saying that, you can, that if we think about saving the world one garden at a time, that's a truly plausible idea. Because if we're doing responsible things in our backyard, whether that means to you organic, I'm not going to use that word, because that's not necessarily what I mean. What I mean, though, is, is that whatever gardening practices you choose to do, whatever garden that you choose to create, is conscious of the environment that it is, its context, basically, and that we should savor what's wonderful about our garden. So a zone-worthy garden to me, this is probably the biggest concept, and the rest of the talk you'll see is kind of broken up. We'll get onto the next slide here about practical artistry. I'm not a designer. I've taken hours of design studios. I, I, some people might call me a designer. I think of myself as a plantsman. Everything starts with plants. It's, it, this is a plant-inspired topic. It's a plant-driven topic, as some people say. But I think what's truly great about gardening is that, you know, while it may be nice to have a guideline for style, maybe how things should look, how we should put things together, I trust that all of you in this room have a sense of what you like, of what you like to see, what colors work for you, what ideas in the garden work for you and which don't. And that through some coaching or through some gentle inspiration, you can create a garden that is the garden that you want. A zone-worthy garden is, I'm, I'm one click ahead, a zone-worthy garden is rich. It's got lots of plant materials. Something, something that, that um, uh, Lindsay from Willow Glen talked about yesterday in his talk down at Mount Pleasant is that, you know, when a garden is rich, when a garden is richly planted, there's maybe no need for mulch. There's no thought of weeds because you've created an environment. There's that environmental idea again, too. And we'll work into all of this throughout the time today. Um, it, you know, a zone where the garden inspires your passion. It inspires you to get out of the house in the morning, to go poke around the garden. Who takes a daily walk through the garden in the summer? It's a ritual, right? Cup of coffee, you know, leave the cell phone inside, no, I, no need for an iPod, none of that stuff. Cup of coffee, glass of water, house slippers and a robe. I live in the country, so I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> maybe it's a little different, but, you know, it's that, that ritual of the morning. And, and above all, a zone-worthy garden has zone-worthy plants, plants that thrive, plants that do good, plants that do super, that do excellent, that live on and on and on. So, the rest of the talk today, on the theme of four seasons, because we can have a truly, four, do, do you think, if I pose the question, could we garden in winter here in Iowa? I think we can. Maybe it's gardening with our eyes, but I think we can. So I, I what are there, seven elements of practical artistry? And these are just ideas. I, I, don't like, I don't like principles of design. I took a class called Principles of Garden Design, and I thought, what a load of, I mean, I, I have a very independent, irreverent style about that, I think, you know? I, I, I trust that each of us has an idea of the things we like. You got dressed and came here today. You have a sense of, you know, how you like to look, how you want your garden to look. 
I think it's doable. So here's, here's seven ideas that we're going to break up. You see the handout is sort of broken up into that, uh, you know, front and back and, and onwards and things. And we're going to start with environment. Because I think the first element of inspiration for a four season garden is to look beyond your yard. If you're thinking, maybe, maybe, you've got, maybe some of you here have a new garden space. You've got a blank slate. And I, I envy blank slates. I think you know, the most fun I've, I've had as a gardener in my life is not watching my plans come to fruition is, but is as much as I have making new plans. Uh, I love the idea of starting a new garden and planting it almost as much as I do thinking about what the end product is. Um, kind of ba almost maybe a backwards philosophy. A lot of us plan with the end in mind and I think the beginnings are a beautiful start. And I think that's because there's such a great, <coughs> there's such a great capacity for our environments around us regardless of where you live, to inspire us to create gardens. So, you know, the, the design textbooks would call that extensional landscape with a very, you know, kind of droll tone to it. I mean, how boring does that sound? You can call it the borrowed landscape. I mean, what, is, what are the views beyond your house? Or, you know, what does the landscape outside of your garden look like? But I also can think of environment as sort of an emotional landscape. You know, what does what is the environment around you or the environment that you want to create in your backyard, what does it do for you? What kind of feelings does it elicit from you? And so, as a kid who grew up, you know, just a mile or two from this prairie right here, I tramped around, you know, five or six years old, and the grass was up to here, and wading my way through it at various points throughout the summer. And I, I was lost in its majesty. I was lost in the, even though it was only 10 acres, surrounded by a hayfield and sort of a busy county highway, just up the road from my grandma's. I was lost. There was a certain majesty and, and almost a magic about it. I also was out on that prairie in the middle of a, just ahead of a thunderstorm and uh, that's uh, what happens when you get about a 60 mile an hour downburst from a thunderstorm and you're out in the middle of this prairie and it's sort of like, of course I'm not smart enough to run from my car, I'm thinking I could catch this grass shot and this, you know, that's, so. But you know, if that, if that does something for you, you know, how could you create that idea in your garden? There's lots of people who've talked about this. If you, has anyone been up to Roy Diblick's place, Northwind Perennial Farm, up around Burlington, Wisconsin? If you haven't, turn your paper over, jot it down. Northwind Perennial Farm, it's up by Burlington, Wisconsin. If you've never heard Roy speak, Roy is the plant whisperer. I mean, he, he is, he's amazing. And this is, this is one of their display gardens. I mean, sure, it doesn't look exactly like the slides we saw before, but the feeling, the emotion, the movement of those grasses, the idea of creating a landscape that not only in some way is linked to the emotions that you have, but in some way linked to the idea of the landscape around us is totally plausible. A very sort of wild and natural plant combination at the same time. This is at Willow Glen here, too. Um, Certainly, a, I mean, gardens are contrived. Some of the, so the problem with, I've, I have with some of this, this philosophy about sort of, you know, natural landscape ideas and things is that there's this idea that we have to sort of template what nature has done. I mean, gardens are contrived spaces. There's no way that we're going to create the kind, I mean, you know, directly replicate the kind of ecological interactions that are happening in that native environment. I don't think that's the point. I mean, the point is to build an environment that we want to be a part of that does so in an ecologically conscious way. And that doesn't mean that uh, you have to be a native plant zealot. I mean, I'm a native plant nut, but I don't certainly grow just native plants. And I, though I don't, I'm careful about what I want to say because I don't want to start an argument about this, but the science, the research does not support the idea that native plants alone are somehow better adapted or, or better than non-native plants are. The idea that we need to be teaching people, that we need to be showing by example, is that we can create environmentally conscious landscapes um, based on how they're put together. And maybe that's not using trees that are you know, incredibly you know, prone to diseases or something. I mean, there's, there's these ideas that sort of underlie those concepts that are sort of away and afar from this idea of non-native versus native. So, I mean, you know, what a drastic departure from the slides before. I mean, it's a whole totally different idea. I mean, if you grew up in the Southwest, maybe this was the kind of environment that you were, uh, that you were surrounded by. The extensional environment, the extensional landscape was a lot different. It was a desert filled with cacti and succulents and xeric loving plants, plants that could thrive on almost no significant or measurable amounts of water in a given year. And that was an environment that you were comfortable in, that you grew up in. And that's certainly you know, fits maybe the, an emotion that you have about that. This is an, I absolutely love this garden. I wish, 
I don't think it's been shot for any magazines, but I wish it would be. This is a little cottage in, in one of the northern suburbs of Oklahoma City that I had the pleasure to visit a couple of years ago. Three of their garden, their house and garden, would fit in this room, I think. I mean, it was incredibly tiny. But these two guys had built this garden and this house that were almost as if they were one. The, uh, the color ideas, the textures, everything they did in their garden was almost like a replication of the colors and textures and ideas that they used in their home decor. So when you walked from the front porch through the house to the back porch where this you know, wonderful container was, you just felt like there was no trans, like th that you were just in one space. And I thought that was a really awesome idea for how to think about the gardens. We could do that here certainly as well. Maybe depending on what your, you know, your taste of your home decor is and whether you maybe, maybe you want to have a division of space. Maybe you want to have the garden be a separate room and a separate idea. Uh, certainly maybe our house, the, the decor of our house maybe doesn't change with the seasons necessarily. Um, but what I loved about this is because they had this sort of fluid idea between house and garden, uh, I, I can imagine that at any time of the year there would have been that feeling there because it did have kind of this rhythm to it. These orange, they had a, it would, there, a lot of the colors in their house were oranges and reds, uh, highlighted by silvers and greens, um, just like you see here. So environment is a pretty big idea. I mean, that's, that's you know, sky's the limit. Whatever the environment is that moves you to. But I think one of the, the core ideas of a Four Season Garden is emblems. I mean, if I said Christmas, what do you think? poinsettias. Well, who'd have thought of poinsettias as a landscape plant? And my, gran my grandparents live in, uh, permanently now in South Texas. And so several years ago when you know, they moved down there permanently, and I, I always visit them a week before Christmas, and it gave me a really interesting idea is that, you know, down there, there is, uh, you might think that there's a rhythm to the season, certainly by, you know, again, it's a heavily, you know, a lot of agriculture in the area, a lot of, a lot of heavy, um, you know, ag industries and things, and so there's a rhythm in that sense, but, you know, the landscape, you know, there's zone 10A, oh, what a dream, right? <laughs> um, it's actually a climate I would hate to garden in, honestly, but, um, you know, so, you know, as we were walking around, you know, they're, uh, uh, this, they live in, live in Mission, Texas, if some of you have maybe have winter homes, you maybe you're familiar with Mission or Macallan, Texas, and so we would go on walks and things, and we would find, you know, poinsettias that were nine and ten feet tall, in full bloom the week before Christmas. And I thought, isn't that really interesting? An emblem of a season that for us is grocery stores and stunted little plants, or, or even you know, the new spray painting that people are doing with points. Oh, God. It's different colors of poinsettias that we spray paint. And it's an emblem of a season, but in a totally different idea. I mean, these are a landscape plant. Actually, this year, they had um, a really kind of, I don't know if you'd call it a late or an early freeze, depending on your, your perspective, but it knocked back all the poinsettias. They had no poinsettias this year um, that were out at Christmas time when I was down there again, too. But that was a couple of years ago, too. I mean, how, you know, how amazing. But when I say, you know, maybe when I say Christmas or when I say winter, maybe this is what you think of. <laughs> Remember that really bad ice storm in 2007? Oh. Yeah, well, that was, this was uh, what it did. We were without power for 10 days, but I was... And despite the fact that I, if, there, if there's one thing, one season, or anything that I come close to hating, hate is, a, hate is a very strong word, but if there's one thing I come close to hating, it's winter, and particularly ice. Large people like me are not skillful on ice, and so, but nonetheless, I was really intrigued by it. I thought, you know, there's obviously nothing I can do about it except whine and moan and complain, but there is a beauty to it. I know that's hard for us to think about this year, but... In any other normal winter, there is something of a beauty to this. And so, uh, is anybody's witch hazel just ready to just go? I have friends in Kansas City who are they're blooming right now. This is a witch hazel on the ISU campus. It'll probably be a few weeks yet. But, um, you know, another emblem of the season, something I always look forward to. I walk past this shrub every day on my way to my office in Horticulture Hall. And... I always check, I mean, I check, I look at the buds and I feel them. I mean, it's a daily ritual. It's an emblem of the season to me. I mean, when that thing blooms, there's sort of a cascade of things that happen in my, in my mind. I know that spring is on its way. It's a sign of early spring. Like just when the willows bloom as well, too. Their fuzzy little catkins come out, too. I have to put in a little plug for my study organism here. My master's is done on, on leatherwoods. Does anybody grow Durka? Durka palustris? I'm spreading the gospel. I'm spreading the gospel. Um, <laughs> So the eastern leatherwoods are another prime, in, in my mind, they're another emblem to me because they bloom, you know, in early, early April, sometimes late March, not this year, um, but early, early to mid-April. 
and their flowers are very small. Have you always noticed that some of the earliest blooming plants in spring have very small flowers? And there's, there's a physiological reason for that, but Gertrude Wister, who was the wife of John Wister, both of them were kind of a very famous horticultural pair in the 1940s, wrote, and I know I'm going to botch this quote, but she basically said that the flowers of early spring uh, were inversely proportional to the amount of joy that they brought us. And I think that's entirely true. I mean, that's, that to me, uh, is sort of like, if that's a definition for an emblem of a season, something that sort of, you know, attaches in your mind to where we're at in the calendar, and at the same time ca opens up this cascade of joy and ideas and emotions, that's what an emblem is. So, we actually, he's blooming in the greenhouse right now, so it's kind of unfair because in my mind it's like, no, it's, it's not, it's too early, but... And that's kind of, they're very small, but after a winter like this, we'll take anything that's blooming in April, right? Or, <laughs> or in, even, you know, in a couple of weeks or something. You know, daffodils, bleeding hearts, these are all famous emblems of seasons. Of course, as an iris person, I couldn't get by without having at least an iris or two in here. This is one of my favorite ones, a little dwarf called Eye of the Tiger. Irises are certainly emblems of the season. And as that fades into summer, too, you know, we get into the lilies, the true lilies. Those are emblems of our summer. Hollyhocks. I used to make hollyhock dolls as a kid, or whatever kind of other things you could make from hollyhocks. There's, there's amazing the number of things you can make from hollyhocks. I actually breed hollyhocks, as strange as that is. But this is, you notice that there are, Chris, you see on the handout, this is hollyhock with Christmas lights. Has anybody been to the Prairie Peddler up in northwest Iowa? It's just around Odebolt. Um, it's out in the country. And about every July, they have a moonlight garden party. And they invite about 200 people out to their, their farm. They've got a big Sears and Roebuck kit barn. And the middle of summer, and it always seems to happen that it's a night where the temperature is just, it's perfect. Evening is perfect. They drape 200 strands of Christmas lights throughout their entire garden, hollyhocks included, up and down plants, sheds, all over the place, and then have wine and light music and small plate foods well into the night. And it's just, it's an incredibly magical experience. And you'll notice that I mention a lot of Midwest and Iowa places, not as a plug for the book, but as the fact that that's another way in which four season gardens, I think, come together, is that when you can appreciate what we have, and, and Iowa has a rich gardening and horticultural scene. It's, it's spread out, it's maybe a little fragmented, uh, that's just basic, based on our geography, but I, I like to always give people a chance to, you know, to see what's around us and see what's out there, too. Bee balms, another fabulous emblem of summer, too. I talked about coneflowers yesterday, and, and I had to throw a coneflower last night. I was like, that's definitely an emblem of season. When I think coneflowers, I think June. I think early July. Gladiolus. Swiss chart. Don't, I mean, and this is, I'm going to disproportionately focus this talk on ornamentals, no doubt. But, I mean, there's, you know, especially in the last couple of years, we've got such a richness in our industry between wanting to cultivate both edibles and ornamentals in the same space or, or finding plants that we can enjoy ornamentally and also get some edible value from, too. And so Swiss chart, the Northern Light series, are just beautiful. A lot of people use them in containers, too, but, of course, they're perfectly edible. And then the seasons, you know, there's no definition to the seasons. They bleed together as July morphs into high summer. And uh, you get these, see a black-eyed Susans. And uh, Wanda, this was in your garden, actually, last summer. Um, this, this amazing, amazing Tropicana. And to me, when I think of, uh, for, for some reason, this photo has become, when I hear high summer, this is what I think of. I think of those hot colors. I mean, it's August, after all. I think of those, you know, that emblazoned feel it leaves on the garden. And high summer fades into the early days of autumn, and goldenrods fill our gardens. White, wispy tufts of miscanthus. I think fall is one of the most beautiful times of the year. I'm really torn as to which is my favorite season, spring or fall. I think spring is so wonderful because of the new... I could do without summer, really, in between. I could just go from, you know, just back and forth, new, old, new, old, and just that rhythm. But it would kind of mess it up, wouldn't it, a little bit. But miscanthus are just fabulous. And those leaves fade... I've deliberately left out a lot of winter shots today because I don't think we need the visual reminder, but, you know, go with me there mentally. Panicle hydrangeas. This particular, you know, this has been a tough year, especially, too, winter-wise. One of the things that uh, a lot of books in the past have talked about winter gardens is, is leaving, you know, leaving the structure of the garden, not cutting it off in the fall. I mean, leaving things, you know, winter gardening for people in the hinter north here is about sort of gardening from the window. I mean, you know, reliving those experiences, seeing what's left, seed heads, fruits, structure, form, things that are left, the more permanent aspects of the design. We're so busy sometimes focused, so busily focused on color. And color is the most obvious aspect of, of a landscape, of a design. I mean, we're, we're obsessed with color. There are millions of books about color 
and everything. I mean, Pantone has a color of the year, after all. I mean, color is a very important part of our lives, but from a design standpoint, I hate to use that word because it sounds pretentious, from a practical artistry standpoint, there are so many other properties that compose the garden that you can create. And so, I, I, I you know, look at plants. Look at plants beyond the color. What kind of form, what kind of structure do they have? And where all this started was that, you know, bark. Bark is a wonderful thing. Some people have said, oh, bark is such a nerdy thing. People don't pay attention to bark. Oh, crap. That was such a big lead up, and I thought the next shot was... You know, <laughs> well, um, what a buzzkill, but... Um, uh, speaking of that panicle hydrangea, after all, has anybody noticed that this winter has been in... Speaking of bark, uh, this is... We'll still keep this going. Um, this has been a terrible winter for rabbits and deer, sort of uh, changing the colors of the bark on certain plants. That panicle hydrangea th that you saw in the slide before is outside my office, and it's got... You know, now the snow's melted, and, you know, there's some space around it. It's got this... It's missing bark from about, you know, from the ground. Well, actually, it's got bark here, and there's no bark here, and more bark, because the snow, you know, these rabbits on top of the snowdrift nibbling away at this poor thing. Uh, so, you know, rabbits pay attention to bark for a, probably a much different reason than what we would, but I promise there's a really great bark shot coming up here in a minute. Fall is not necessarily a time for endings, though. Some things are just blooming in fall. Who grows autumn crocus or colchicums? There is nothing more exhilarating to me than to walk out into the garden and, you know, giddily scream at the thought and at the sight of these fall crocuses in bloom. My mother does the same thing now, too. I, I have them all over the yard, and she called me, I was sometime in probably mid to late September, just ecstatic. She's like, there's something blooming in the backyard. She's, she's, she's a gardener, but she's not a plant nerd. She gave that to her son, I think, somehow. But, so she calls me, she's like, there's something blooming. And I was like, I was trying to, you know, in her excitement, figure out what this was. And it was an autumn crocus that she was talking about. This one over here on the side, these, uh, these are both double ones, actually. This one's called water lily, and this one's called alba plena. And it's such a great way to sort of finish off the season. I mean, it, the fall doesn't have to be an end. There are plenty of things that, that do strut their stuff in fall, too. And, of course, fall color on, on maples and all sorts of things. Um, Make it fantastic. That bark shot must be coming up here at the end of plants <laughs> that inspire. It is. It's number 82. I know where it's at in my mind. But um. <coughs> So we have an inspiration from the environment. We have a sense of what the seasons look like in our head. I mean, I could do this. We could sit here for hours, like on a, you know, some sort of psychological examination and go, if I said June 1st, what would you think? And you could jot something down and... And those ideas, if you're building a new garden or if you're thinking about some way to take the garden that you have and improve its sort of four season qualities, start there. Take a walk in the garden. Take just, you know, especially with your camera. If you like photography, even if you don't, take pictures of your garden. Take pictures of your garden every day. Actually, we're going to walk through At the end of this talk, there's a section called A Year in an Iowa Garden. And I built our, our most recent project was an 85-foot wall that we built in our front yard. It's, it's a Saxa tile garden, so there's plants with rocks, basically. And I deliberately build it around this whole hypothesis. And so we'll take sort of a season-by-season season look because I shoot that garden every single day, at least that I'm home, um, you know, during the summer to sort of catalog it through its seasons. And that's something you can do as well. You know, watch what happens. Think about what happens. I'm working with Fine Gardening on a couple of stories for, that'll be out in a couple of years from now on this very idea is to sort of, because especially when it comes, you know, it's, we're pretty easy. When it comes to spring, we got that down. When it comes to early summer, we got that down. When we start to get into late summer, high summer, we start to lose some traction because then we think August and we think school and, you know, summer hours are, are ending and it's hot and, you know, life in the garden for a lot of people sort of sinks into a, a depressing hole until the fall color kicks in and then we get excited and then we have to think, oh, we have to clean all this up and then, and then winter comes. Um, it's kind of a rushed ending almost. And, and so we're working on some pieces to get people to think about what, can be, what plants can really handle high summer. And if there's a place that we need to try all plants that work in high summer, it's here in the Midwest because high summer is also known as hell. <laughs> but vignettes are so important too. You know, and, and you know, this came up and I know in a couple of talks yesterday too. And I, I, I call this the vignette hypothesis. It's not original to me. I, I stole it from somebody else and, you know, bo borrowed it. And, and this is not an original idea. The idea is, is that, especially if you have a smaller yard, or regardless of the size of your yard, it can be really daunting when there's a big patch of nothing to think about what you want to do with it. 
You can think about maybe what you want out of the space. You can think of the big ideas, but there's sometimes a disconnect between how do I get from what I want to the picture I see in my head. And, and I, I sometimes think that the wrong way to do it is to start big and work small because there's still that hole in the middle. I think sometimes it's best to start small and work up. Think about plant combinations. Think about vignettes. Those little window frames, you know, out in the garden. Those little moments that happen. And when you start thinking about those moments, those little vignettes, then you can start thinking about specific plants that comprise those vignettes. And then you can start finding, if you start making lists of plants, I mean, if you're, if you're, you're very you know, dutiful about this and you want to get all kinds of paper and pens and stuff out, you can start making lists of plants that you want to try, new plants that you heard at Kelly's talk today, and <laughs> things that you want to grow. And you can start assembling those to vignettes, and you'll see things that come up, like rhythms and themes and ideas and similarities. So I say dream and landscape. You know, have an idea where that big picture is going to start. But plant in portrait. Think about those vignettes one at a time. So we're going to go to Willow Glen for a little, uh, uh, little sort of exercise in this. This was taken a couple of years ago in really hot morning light, so I apologize for the quality of the photo there. Um, but the four arrows indicate four vignettes. So, you know, snapshot that picture. Take a look at it. Gosh, it feels good, right? Look at those chairs, too. And just, do you want to go sit down? <laughs> you want to go grab a cup of coffee and just go sit. But watch where those four arrows go. And here's the first, actually, that's the second one. A, one trellis covered with one plant. A Duchess of Albany Clemens. And which happened to be, it was a very dewy morning that morning, which happens to be just dripping in dew. One single plant on a trellis. That can be a vignette. It's an idea. It's a moment in time, a moment in the garden. This is actually the first one. The hummingbird mints or the agastache with the blue oak grass. Two plants. Texturally different, contrasting colors, incredibly simple. Yet another vignette. Remember something, though, about that first shot, that landscape, that dream in the landscape. Did it feel like it went together? Did it feel like it had a unity to it, like there was sort of a, a cohesiveness to it? But look at how different these vignettes are. If I showed you the vignettes first and then the landscape, you may not have even known that these were all from the same garden. As if maybe three, four, or five plants in this particular shot, and then the, the pale purple coneflower and the geraniums there as well. This is not at Willow Glen. I should have put another black slide in here too. But the idea is, is that if you start thinking in portraits, in window panes. Start thinking about what your favorite plant combinations are. And we're going to look at some really great, what I think are really fun ones, photos that I keep coming back to over and over. This is at Ryman Gardens. I mean, just, I think what's really great here is the geometry, They're this sort of replication of cylindrical, circular heads. I mean, you've got the alium down here in the front and then the oryngium up there too, and it's just kind of got this kind of silly, rolly ball looking feeling going up there too. All the way up in height to that uh, lavender mist meadow rue, the thalictrum over there at the side of the page. This kind of just cascade of height and texture and shape and ideas. This is when you can start playing with the art and start making fun. This happened, and, and you'll see on the list there too, I think one of the ends, one of the ideas that I had under practical artistry was serendipity. Sometimes it's just fun to see what happens. Let things go to seed sometimes. Let things flop over into something else. This happened in my garden this last summer. This artemisia, uh, the, the silver here, the Louisiana sage, has a tendency to run about a little bit. And I'm not always good about keeping up with it necessarily. And it happened to run in between a bush clematis, which is the blue up there in the corner, and this utterly fabulous plant marketed under the name Dreamcatcher. It's a Colquitsia beauty bush. It just glows. It just drips with this golden color. And how uh, this actually I may still even be on the front page of my website because I just love this combination. It just happened. I couldn't have planned that or thought about that. Maybe I could have if I'd given it some thought, but there's certainly not three plants that I would have put together. It happened. It was one of those sort of joyous moments of serendipity. And of course, what's and there's will be several opportunities to do this in the rest of the talk today. Look at this shot. I've got nice tech and color and stuff going on, and three weeks later. That's a blessing. That change in rhythm of the seasons is a blessing, I think, and it's a fabulous opportunity for people who love plants and love gardens uh, to watch something like that happen. And, I mean, you know, the three things that are pulling that together, we have an Amsonia on the front, one of the, uh, this is Amsonia ciliata, one of the blue stars, which the Amsonias have fabulous fall color, great, great yellow fall color like that too. This is actually going to be the perennial plant of the year in 2011. That's, excuse me, Amsonia hubrichtii is, they look about the same, but that'll be the 2011 perennial plant of the year. 
a blue spruce, and then the Panama red, the Panama red hibiscus there in the center. Three plants. See, I mean, there's other stuff in there as well, as well, of course, but three plants that really seal that whole thing together. This is out in Portland, Oregon, at the Garden Writers uh, Conference a couple of years ago. We went to several private gardens, and and this, this gal just loved, this is um, Mexican he uh, feather grass. It's not hardy here, but you can use it as an annual. And she, it's, it's a perennial in Portland, and she just loves it. It's all over her yard. Her yard is just soft. I mean, because it just, it looks about as soft as it feels. I mean, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. The whole garden has this very kind of, you know, great, cozy feeling to it. But look at all the other kinds of textures she used. And this is just as you walk in the front gate. And that idea is sort of wrapped around this small little suburban lot that she has. That's a, ba that's a banana, actually. This is actually in her neighbor's garden. Two neighbors that have totally different gardens, but yet have very similar ideas about the appreciation of the seasons. The texture contrasts are there, too. The cannas versus the Japanese Hakone grass, the Hakone Kloa. Those were in September, by the way. And that's the beauty of Portland, I guess, sometimes. But... Another place, if you're ever out in the Portland area too, and as, as gardeners and horticultural lovers, if you have not been to Portland at some point in your life, you must, it's like a mecca, it's, a, it's an homage that we must make. One of the places, if, you, if you, uh, uh, you make it down to Eugene, home of the University of Oregon, is to what I think is one of, in the gardens I've been fortunate to see, one of the best small gardens in this entire country, and it's called Northwest Garden Nursery. And if you've seen all these new hellebores coming out, these new big flowered spotty hellebores from Terra Nova Nursery, it's those people that are breeding it, Ernie and Marietta O'Brien. And their garden is just, I'm, I could move in tomorrow and <laughs> cast the world goodbye. It is just, it's, it moves me. It just, I just, you know, it's a place you walk into and it's just sort of like you just feel at home. And, and yeah, they've got all kinds of cool plants, but that first moment had nothing to do with what plants they had. It had to do with the kind of environment they had created. You know, they've got Douglas firs, which are part of the, you know, the Oregon landscape, or kind of the foundations of their yard, and then they have just created art in between. And it's truly, truly beautiful. Just evidenced by that. There's another couple of shots coming up from their nursery in a little bit. So we've got emblems down, we have an inspiration, and now we have an idea for how we can put these together. We can think in portrait. Plant and portrait and dream and landscape. But just as our eyes love contrast when it comes to seeing the screen better or when we put sunglasses on, contrasts in the garden are important too. Some people call contrast texture, but I like to think of contrast in a lot bigger way. Contrasts <clears throat> come in a variety of, w of ways. I think every garden needs a couple of diva plants. Plants that just sort of go, sit down, shut up, I've got this, we're going to be good. And I put a couple of diva plants in here in the next couple of slides. You can see, and then but the divas need some dancers. They need some motion, some stuff happening around them. Well, they, they do their aria or whatever you want to, whatever, however, however far you want to take that analogy. But then there's the obvious contrast in texture, size of leaves. You know, that's probably you know, the, the classical definition of texture. You know, a big fat leaf like a can on a really fine leaf like a grass. There's also texture, or there's also contrasts in space. And we'll see that in, the, in I'll probably explain that better with a photo, I think. There's contrasts in time, how one plant can look at one point in the season and how it can look later in the season and still be ornamentally attractive. Maybe that's a plant that has really great voluptuous flowers and then really, really fine looking fruit. And then there's contrasts in ideas. Some people call that whimsy, sticking a pink flamingo in the front yard. It's certainly a contrast. Um, perhaps not tasteful, but certainly a contrast. Um, I'm not judging if you like pink, fl pink flamingos. It just go right ahead. It's your garden after all. <laughs> and and this, these could be serendipity. Sometimes when something reseeds and you don't expect it, and then all of a sudden you come out and you go, where did this come from? And then you kind of go, gee, that's kind of cool. It happened. It's this, this contrast and idea. It's not the idea that you had, but some bird or the wind or some vector of nature decided that that was the idea that it had. So there's contrast and ideas. Contrast is fun to play with. Oh, I love conifers, and I love dwarf conifers, and I don't have enough room for them in my current garden, so say my parents. I could find lots of room for them but in their current yard, but they've, you know, there's not enough room for a lot of trees and shrubs and that kind of stuff, too. But when I have my next garden, this diva is going in. This is, Taylor, this is Pinus contorta, Taylor's sunburst. All the new foliage is yellow like that. Mm-hmm. There's lots of mm-hmms and mm, yeah, uh-huh. A plant I talked about yesterday, <laughs> to great effect, if anybody was, uh, was there yesterday, Echinacea pixie meadowbright. 
this lovely little dwarf coneflower that just blooms and blooms and blooms and blooms and blooms for weeks upon weeks, four to six weeks of bloom. Utterly fabulous. You know, I did a whole talk on coneflowers, all these crazy new varieties we've got out, all these crazy new colors. And my favorite of them all was just a nice pink purple one that's about that tall and blooms forever. Pixie meadow bread. And, and you're going to see this, and this is in my front garden, and you'll see it at the end of the talk, and you'll see that it just kind of, there's, there's one plant in this whole space. There needs to be more, but there's one. And you'll see how one plant in this 85 foot long bed just rules the day. I mean, it's a diva plant. It's, it's got it. Another diva plant, which and this is this other thing too, is that sometimes a garden can have too many divas, just like an opera company can have too many divas, and then that doesn't work out so well. These happen to be planted right beside each other, and it's just way too much. One of them's got to move. I haven't decided which one's going to move. Um, this, is, this is a new phlox. Again, it's a more compact form. It's called peppermint twist. It's powdery mildew resistant, or as much, as, as much resistance as phlox can have. After a summer like last summer, when it was so terribly humid and so wet, I never saw a single spot of mildew or black spot or anything on it. So it gets, there's lots of, oh, oh, well, there's lots of stars going by that one, as it should. It's a great plant. And it blooms and blooms and blooms and blooms for well. It blooms for seven weeks. Bloomed for seven weeks last year. My God, a phlox that blooms for seven weeks. That's a diva plant. Unfortunately, both divas in this in my garden are planted right beside each other. And it can just be, I, I love the combination, but it's almost a little obnoxious because it's just sort of like, they're just, it's like a fight between them to see I'll outlast you, you know, who's, who can bloom longer. Another a plant that it will just sort of starkly change whatever idea you have. This is an Eryngium, and they've got such great spiky, pointy texture to them as well. Bristly texture almost. This actually was still holding its color. That's what's great about these is that these aren't actually, the flowers are actually right here. These are actually bracts. They're more like leaf structures than they are flower structures, which means they can hold their color forever. This photo was taken at the Des Moines Botanical Center on October 26th of this last year. I mean, the plant first started blooming probably in July, and so it was holding that very steely electric blue color almost through the whole season. Another diva plant, I did a blog post on diva plants this last summer, and this, I had a couple of them in there. And this is, I had, I had to have a shade area in my backyard that I, I call it my garden of errors and experiments and mistakes, because it, I started, when we moved to the house, 96, I think I started that garden too. So I was a wee lad, um, just throwing plants in because I didn't know what I was doing or I was crazy and I was having too much fun. And so it kind of created this really monotonous, uh, you know, now it's, it's sort of turned into this sort of monotonous blob of shade area in the backyard. And so I'd set out in the last couple of years to kind of change this whole thing. And I had always wanted to grow one of these, a golden comfrey, a symphytum. <coughs> Unfortunately, this is kind of hard to find. There's a link to, there's one place that's carrying it, um, Seneca Hill Perennials. It's on, there's a link on my website on the handouts and downloads section. And this is truly one of those plants that, by the way, that's, a, I have added several now, but that plant was, this was taken in about August, and that plant was, came in a, about a four inch square pot in May, and it was about that tall, and that's what it had done in one season. I mean, it's a plant that you could that I literally sort of planted, and it just all of a sudden changed the backyard. I mean, it was like it was just, you know, it's sheer brightness. It's sheer uh, boldness just changed everything in that backyard. That's a diva plant, another great one. But then you need some background. Grasses are great dancers. They're great fillers. They're great supporting cast members. Things like as, just as, as, you know, mundane as maybe, as, I, I don't necessarily think it's mundane. It's, I think it's lovely. It has its place. It's something like Carl Forrester grass. When you see, this is kind of changing the, the emphasis here uh, a little bit on, um, on contrasts, maybe from a textural standpoint, black and white is a great way to evaluate texture because our eyes always see color first. And when you get rid of color, our eyes think, oh, where do we go? And we start looking at shapes in positive and negative space. And that's what's happening here. You can see that there's a lot of other plants around, but what two plants do you see first? You see this big guy, which is a Petocytes, which some of you may have grown and chose not to because it does run around a little bit. Um, some varieties are not terrible, are not as hardy here as some of the other ones, and so the winter kind of keeps them in check. I don't mind. I don't mind that they run about. I kind of like plants that are a little aggressive because it's sort of like war of the plant world out there a little bit. You can you know, see who wins. And then there's some hostas here that sort of contrast that. So, I mean, I think in one, if I had to choose one slide that summed up what the traditional idea of texture meant, I think that that pretty well does it, as does that one as well. 
the same idea. Also, maybe kind of a diva situation there as, as well. Texture is also uh, something that happens in, in time and space. And you can see here in this really simple vignette, right outside the Christina Ryman butterfly wing at Ryman Gardens, there's this limelight hydrangea and some carefree roses and the cat mint. And you can imagine, I mean, limelight hydrangea blooms for a long time, but you can imagine that this sort of balance between these three plants changes throughout the season. As the rose comes into bloom, maybe just at the, as the, the hydrangea is blooming, you know, I wish I had a shot of this vignette after, you know, uh, successionally throughout the summer, and you would see this rhythm, this sort of contrast of the same three plants just dancing together throughout the season, too. Uh, that's at Northwest Garden Nursery. That was one of the first things I saw when I came into their nursery, and I just, I, I mean, it's just incredible, right? Um, I always like to see, people see different things when they see this. Who sees the Carex first? The, yeah, because you're, and I think that was probably what she had designed to be. It just sort of like, there's a little path here. Her paths are very narrow, which makes some people uncomfortable, but at the same time, it reduces the amount of space that you sort of see between borders. It just sort of feels like it's one big tapestry. So I think that was a really smart move on her part. Um, some, for, some people see that first, the Cordideria, the, uh, that's the true pompous grass um, that are not hardy here. And I think some people, ha I, I actually tested, this. some people th see this first. It depends on whether, if you have a varying levels of red-green colorblind or something, if, depending on which one that you see. Um, but most people, s I, I certainly see that first. And she certainly has that idea replicated with grassiness throughout the rest of the design. You know, they always talk about that a garden should have certain amounts of repetition. And some professional landscape designers think that that means four plants used nauseatingly over and over and over and over again. Repetition can be an idea. Grassiness this sort of frilly idea used over and over and over again, even though it's not the same plant. I mean, those two are, obviously, but not used over and over and over again. It's the idea that's replicated. That's the contrast in space. One plant, too, and I should have put in a plant of this that was blooming. This is Monarda bradburyana, the eastern horse mint. And some, you know, I showed a bee balm shot earlier, and bee balms, you know, pe are, you know people are very familiar with them. You know, they've certainly been grown for a long time, but Gosh, who hates the powdery mildew on them? I mean, it just destroys them. It just messes that whole... I mean, who cares if they have red flowers? The silveriness below isn't always that attractive. <clears throat> but here's one that actually is disease-resistant. Re disease I mean, if there's truly something like that in Monarda. And I should show you, there's a shot of it on my blog in Bloom, but I thought what was even better about it is that it actually gets kind of mahogany fall color, but in between when it blooms in kind of June and the fall color in September, those heads, if you leave them, look fabulous backlit by light. How is it that something as ubiquitous as light has sort of been forgotten about in the topic of making gardens? There's a shot coming up in a little bit of a, of a red bud, a forest pansy red bud, which has red foliage. And I, I laid under the tree and looked, shot, the, and, and it'll just, you know, it'll move you, I hope. It, move, it moves me. People thought it was crazy laying on my back taking a picture up through this tree, but... This last one is really interesting, too. This is a contrast in, this is maybe almost serendipity. I don't know what this is. Lilies, I don't generally think of as having exceptional fall color, but some years you do see this. And this photo was taken a couple of years ago on November 2nd with an Asiatic lily still holding its fall color. It was so bizarre to me. I walked out there and it was just this, you know, it was not an idea that I had planned on. It wasn't a, a contrast that I expected. It was a contrast in sort of time, you know, just by virtue and chance. Observing what happens in the garden, observing plants, uh, can open up a tremendous number of insights. Here's another contrast in time. Anyone want to guess when this one was taken? There's an iris and a galardia. It was actually taken on, in the third week in November a couple of years ago because that's a re-blooming iris. That's a dwarf iris. This, it's a really, really macro shot. It's maybe not that great, but uh, this is a little miniature that happens to rebloom once the nights get cool again in the fall. And there's nothing more sort of alarming to some people. I mean, I get calls at the nursery going, I have irises blooming in the fall. What have I done? What's wrong with them? What can I do to stop them? Why would you stop them? <laughs> it's, that, it's this contrast in time. It's not expected in the fall. And it's wonderful when that happens. I've got these planted sort of strategically. I mean, rebloom is kind of an environmental thing. Sometimes it happens really well, and sometimes it doesn't. And it's always nice to see people come to pick their iris orders up, and they're walking up along, and they, you know, they kind of walk, and, and then they stop, and they see an iris in bloom, and that's, you know, 
That's a very important contrast as well, too. Another maybe sort of obvious textural contrast between that as well. So we've got some of these principles and these bones down, and now we can just have fun with filling in the blanks. We can just go through and look at plants that inspire us, plants that move us. So, I mean, you know, we could do a whole talk with no slides, just you and me up here in chairs talking about plants that inspire us and plants that we love in our garden that we want everybody to have so they can enjoy the same things that we do about them. So I guess that's what this talk is, or this part of the talk is, is plants, zone-worthy plants in some instances, plants that are truly going to do well and thrive, uh, that instigate our passion, that want, we want to get out there and we want to watch them bloom, we want to watch that fruit, we want to watch the, the butterflies, you know, cover the shrub or whatever it is. We get out of the garden and that's, that's is this forest pansy red bud shot. I mean, you know, have you ever thought about what your trees look like at different times of the day with the light? I mean, it's a, just a, it's a magical thought to have, and once you, especially when you see it and you can think about it. And, and actually, there was a book um, that Ethne Clark, who's now the editor at Organic Gardening Magazine, she wrote a book on gardens in fall a couple of, well, several years ago. And she talks about it in a part of that, sort of the moment in her life when she realized that, you know, things could be backlit and things could look good in different lights, that it sort of opened up this whole new idea about where she could put trees and different plants that could show off, like that Menarda in a couple of shots ago, to get that kind of backlit look to the plant. Forest pansy actually is hardy here. It's hardy in my, in my garden in southern Iowa. Um, it's rated to zone 5. I don't know that a lot of people grow it this far north. This was in Savannah, Georgia. Magnolias, too. This is uh, a plant I wish more people would try. A lot of references for years have told people, don't, 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 you can't grow that. You live in the north. It's Magnolia seboldii, a cultivar called Colossus. And there's one place, to my knowledge, in the state that you can get it. It's a little nursery called Ridge Road Nursery. People are nodding, that's great. Ridge Road Nursery, south of Dubuque. Run by a guy by the name of Gene Kaufman. He's such a gem, such a gem. And, and some people think he's got some magical touch about him for, for plants, but if you've been to his nursery, you know that Ridge Road is, uh, is, is not just some colloquial name for, a, uh, for his address. It's literally a road that is on top of a ridge overlooking the Mississippi River. So I wouldn't, no, wouldn't necessarily say that it's some sort of plush environment up there to necessarily grow plants, but it's, it's wooded. But this is a plant I wish more people would try. I think it's, it's, it's a fabulous plant. And it's a magnolia that sort of, you know, blooms into the, uh, the heat of the summer, not maybe normally when we think um, early summer, not maybe when we normally think of other magnolias blooming. And it's shorter, too. I mean, it's got great size to it. Um, this, is a, this is Pinus parviflora up in Gary Wittenbaugh's garden. If you've, I'm sure many of you know Gary, and his garden up in Old Wine is just a, a, you know, another sort of mecca for people who love conifers and love plants in this state too. And you know, this is a really kind of tight shot of, of sort of the, uh, uh, the male floral structures on this pine too, but you know, that have such a brilliant red color against those silvery bands on those foliage. A plant that you just want to sort of go up and just kind of look at this closely and you just want to appreciate in the garden. The new growth on a weeping hemlock. And the Bickelhopped Arboretum as well, I, th I think is just a fabulous collection of plants that you are, I'm jealous of because you're so much closer than I am in the western part of the state, but um, Hesterman Silver, Horseman Silberlock, uh, the famous, famous fir, a plant that I have never seen look bad. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things that you can go all over the country and see this plant and it's just like it's a memory that comes back to you, a feeling of what this plant does for you. That's a plant that inspires. An old, old Clematis viticella called Betty Corning. Alan Armitage wrote a book called Legends in the Garden and Who in the Heck is Nellie Stevens? And one of the people he talked about is who in the heck was Betty Corning? And you can read about it in that book. It's a fun little book about how plants got their names kind of thing. And, you know, this is a Clematis that blooms kind of just, you know, ramblingly throughout the summer and, and looks really great draped in dew. A plant that needs to be grown far, far more than it is. Uh, this is a skull cap, what a flattering name, right? Scutellaria incana, a hoary skull cap. <laughs> hoary meaning gray, incana is, is gray. This is number 66 on plants that inspire. This is a woodland plant. It's native mainly to the Ozarks and into the Wachita Mountains in northern Arkansas. This photo was taken in the wild. I, was, I did a botanical expedition to the Ozarks this last summer and this was taken in the wild too. It blooms here about the end of June into July. 
it's that color of blue in the shade. My database of plants doesn't turn up a whole long list of things that are blue that bloom in July in the middle of the shade. Um, certainly there are options, but definitely a plant that needs to be grown more. And the best way, the best way I've ever seen it used was at the Missouri Botanic Garden with a bunch of um, hydrangea arborescence, smooth hydrangea. So, because it is, it's a little taller and it's got some wispiness to it. We're actually going to start some breeding with it to see if we can size them down and bring out the colors from some of the other scuttle areas. But if you've got some larger shrubs or small, well, kind of mid-sized shrubs that can hold that structure up, you get these great wand blue flowers that are just something else. Um, it can, it varies, in the, it depends on the soil it's on. In the wild, it grows, it can grow on really rocky soils and it'll only get about 16 inches tall. If it's on what we would say good garden soil, it'll be upwards of 30 to 36 inches tall. More eryngiums. I think eryngiums are an underappreciated group of plants all around. This is eryngium planum. It's a little cultivar called blue hobbit. And if blue hobbit is happy, and when I say blue hobbit is happy, it means that it's thriving in the most miserable conditions that you could think about. Hot. I've got mine in clay. I've got mine in gravel. It doesn't care. It just wants to be abused and forgotten about until it blooms in July in an electric tone of blue that attracts these little wasps. I'm not an entomologist, but I would love to know what these little wasps are that come and just cover these flowers. Your garden will hum. It's really, really enchanting. Uh, I don't know how I took a picture without getting one of those wasps in here. And they recede a little bit, not obnoxiously, but just sort of pleasantly. They're pleasant little weeds, you might say, all around the place, too. And they come from these little basil rosettes of foliage that have kind of a spiky lettuce look to them. They're kind of blue-green in color, and they send up this head, and they just do their thing. A lot of fun. Another eryngium, of course, that's native here. This is Rattlesnake Master, Eryngium yuccifolium. Another eryngium that's got, I mean, another almost diva plant. I mean, you could plant this somewhere, and it's going to change that idea. It's got that bristly structure to it that just makes you go, mm-mm. Big blue stem. Another ornamental grass that I don't think is, uh, we, we grow the heck out of little blue stem. But big blue stem can get, a, I mean, on, on good garden soils, which all of us have, um, deep, rich topsoil that goes down for feet, right? Uh, you know, big blue stem can get a little obnoxious and get really tall because it's normally used to growing, A, under competition, and B, in prairie areas that maybe don't have that sort of richness to soil that we've kind of artificially engineered in our gar gardens sometimes. But what is so wonderful about this, the stem of a grass is called a calm. See, the calm that you see here is multicolored up and down the surface, and there's a tremendous amount of variation out there. We've got six selections that we're looking at for possible introduction. There's one that could be coming out next year from a guy out in Illinois called Red Bull. And it's fire engine red all season long, not just fall color. Because there's so much variation that people just, we haven't explored as horticulturists yet. Uh, so you get this great multicolor effect. This was actually taken out in a prairie where I made some of these selections from. And you get, you know, can you imagine this sort of silvery yellow color? Um, I'm almost certain Bob will talk about a blue stem next week, so, or next month. And I won't tell you anything about it, which means you have to come back and learn. Um, so, but he'll talk about a great blue stem uh, that is just, you know, another must-have plant. Something that's really going to inspire you to get out in the yard in late summer and fall. Indian grass. Another great grass that is uh, underappreciated but is fabulous in the fall and a tough, tough, tough plant. Who grows Kirin Gashoma, the yellow waxy bells? Fall blooming, yellow. They're called yellow waxy bells because if you look at the individual petals, they're like slices of lemon. I mean, they're incredibly thick and they last. And it blooms in the shade in September. Not too many queries in the database coming up with things that bloom in the shade in September. Another very, very tough plant. Likes dry shade, too, which is uh, an inspiring note <laughs> for a lot of us that suffer from dry shade. Seven Sunsflower, Heptacodium myconioides. Does anybody grow Seven Sunsflower? Isn't that a plant that you just absolutely look forward to in the fall? I mean, as if the white flowers aren't enough, because every insect for miles comes to your garden to pollinate those and look at those, right? But then, then... When the flowers are done, you get the sepals that are left that turn this hot pink color. And then if you've limbed it up, you get the bark value. So let's see, flowers in fall, this sort of lasting sepal structure through the end of fall, the bark through the winter, and this kind of nice big shrubby form throughout the summer. There's a four-season plant. And a very important comment to make at this point is that a four-season garden does not necessarily have to have four-season plants. I hope that I've made that sort of indirectly clear through what I've t said today is that, unfortunately, that's how some authors have approached it in the past, that a four-season garden has to be about plants that have all this added value to them. I don't think it has to be at all. It's about a garden that, as a composite presentation of plants, 
shows off those emblems of the seasons, thinks about those vignettes that have rhythms and patterns across the landscape, and that cause you to go out. I mean, you could have a garden the size of this podium, or this area up here, that have, would have very few plants, maybe. But you could have a very rich and dynamic four-season garden, because in the spring, it may cause you to go out and look for those small flowers. In the summer, you may be able to appreciate the form of a shrub. In the fall, maybe be able to look at its fruit. In the winter, enjoy its bark. Maybe on one plant, maybe on several plants. It, it can be either way. F uh, fruit. I wish, I, I, wish, I wish a book on fruit would sell because I've got lots of great fruit shots. This isn't a terribly great one, but this is Eastern Wahoo. Euonymus atropurpureus. Relative of bittersweet, same family as bittersweet, the C Gets these hot, hot, hot pink capsules that open up to reveal these sort of uh, orange seed-like fruits. And this was a particularly great fruiting year. All of mine were just laden with fruit by the end of the fall. And it's one of those things, I mean, this was, you know, like end of October again is when this fruit, those really color up perfectly. And people are out in the garden going, you know, what is this? I mean, it's, you know, because there's not a lot else happening at that point in the garden. So just like in the spring, one or two plants can carry you out into the garden based on what time of year it is. And of course, bittersweet. This is our native bittersweet, not the nasty Japanese bittersweet that is terrible and bad and awful that none of you should grow. This is Celastra scandens, our native bittersweet. Uh -oh. ah. A lot of the clematis have actually really excellent uh, infructescences. That's your botanical term of the day. It's not a fruit head, or it's an infructescence, as they say, or a seed head, but it's a seed head for our purposes. Clematis tangutica can be a little obnoxious, and it's, some, call, some clones are, are weedy, and actually, if you go out to Denver, it's not native to this country, but if you go out to Denver, you'll see Clematis tangutica on random city street blocks growing up fences because it's just reseeded in two. But it's strange because there'll be one plant out in the middle of nowhere, and obviously this plant is producing all kinds of seed, and it's not spreading, so it's kind of, it, it just depends on the clone that you have. This was out in Oregon again, too, um, although there's there many people who grow this here in the state. It, it's perfectly hardy. It does, does fine. Again, the, the flowers are almost like kind of orange or lemon peels. They're really thick, kind of yellowy, uh, yellow to orange colored. But then you get that. I mean, the, the flowers are smallish. I mean, they're only about this big. And they, they produce a lot of them, but who cares about that? I want this. I mean, this is sort of like, this is a plant that is inviting you to touch it. Come out and play with your plants. I mean, this is, I mean, you know, amazing. Old man's beard is the common name, incidentally. I am, I'm, I'm nuts over cat. This is maybe the one exception to the, the list of plants that maybe be, aren't terribly zone-worthy plants here, but I had to throw it in because I love the fruit value to it. This is a calicarpa, an Amer or a beauty berry, but this is a white-fruited form. Um, I, some people have had some luck with them this far north. I wouldn't maybe suggest them if you're looking for a plant that's absolutely going to thrive and do well. You may have to sort of give it a little extra protection too, but if that's what you're into, that's fine. It is, it'll, if it gets a chance to bloom before it gets too cool, it'll put on a good fruit display. But it's, it's not necessarily a zone-worthy plant, maybe for this part of the country, but it's got an absolutely amazing floral or a fruit display in the fall, too. And a plant that, you know, this, is in, this was taken in September, and, you know, you go out and you see this kind of fruit, and you, you just, it's just amazing. I mean, it's not only an aesthetic look, but it's a... I had never, I mean, I, I've always loved aliums, but I've never really had much of an opportunity to do a whole lot with them just because maybe they weren't real high on my list. And in the last year or two that started to change and one of the things that kind of inspired that was this sort of unexpected fall color that I saw on one at Ryman Gardens. And it was just, it just literally, I was out teaching a class actually and I just sort of stopped and my students were like, why is he not talking? And I was just sort of like entranced by this alien that had this, you know, little like licorice sticks of yellow and that were just, you know, it was a totally different idea to me and I thought, Wow, I mean, this is Alium senescens, one of the fall blooming ornamental onions. And I thought, wow, that's you know, not an aspect of that plant. It inspired me to want to plant it. <laughs> this used to be a joke, and the, la the, last, the last version of this I did, I had, I had it broken out by seasons instead of these kind of ideas. And, I had it, and someone noticed at the end of the talk that I had a kale shot in every season. And it's one of these amazing four season plants. I always bet out tons of kale in one, in one of our iris display beds. And I watched them for a couple of years. Um, and sometimes they'll, they'll, you know, that was in early spring, you know, they really can color up well in fall. And hey, who knows, look, they're still doing good when they get that first snow. Uh, and uh, so I always joke that kale were the perfect four season plant. Um, 
because I think I have shots of them about every time of the year. I mean, you know, it's pretty. It's just, it's lovely. This is a little blue fescue. Again, not a grass that I would go, you know, run and, and give a lot of high praise to because they can really meld out during the, the, uh, the summers. But I've got a few of them in the garden too, and this was a couple of years ago during that ice storm, and it just, every single blade was coated. And, and, I, and as much as I wanted to rip them out because I don't like the fact that they sort of melt apart in the summer, I had to leave it on the off chance we'd get another ice storm and I could see this again. There's the bark shot. <laughs> Mind is a terrible thing to lose. Um, this is a paper bark maple uh, that, that, that do fine here and that have amazing, amazing bark. I mean, a plant that could be leafless so long as it had that bark, I wouldn't care. Truly a four season plant, just for one trait alone. So, you know, sit back. The other two ideas that were on the list were rhythm and serendipity. And rhythm is kind of a hard thing to talk about abstractly without just seeing it. And I don't pretend for a minute that my garden is anything special, but it's special to me, and that's what counts. And it happens to be that it fits the template for what we're talking about as far as the fact that I planted it so I could get these photos out of them. Um, when you get really into photography, you start thinking about plants and gardens in ways in which you can photograph them and think, which that's, that's an inspiration to, you know, to how to garden and things too. So, you know, this garden started out, um, first plants were planted in 2006. And so this shot was from 2008. And a lot of tags, a lot of small plants. Uh, and the idea has changed overall. It wasn't meant to be a rock garden per se, an alpine garden. It was a saxatile garden. Uh, was my homage to short plants. I like short plants. Being a tall person, I like short things, ironically. I like tall plants too, but I wanted to have a garden in which I could put, this is a front yard garden. This is right along our, we have a really long driveway as you come up to the nursery, and it's very narrow because of our house and where our patio sits, and I, after all these years, I just decided it was just an atrocity and we had to fix it. So we built an 85 foot long limestone wall that only gets about four and a half feet tall at its highest point. It's a pretty low wall for the most part. So this was in 2008, so it had been in the ground kind of two years. And gardens are subject to change, too. This is the end of 2008. This is the very beginning of 2009. And yes, I'm a plant collector, so tags are littered all over the place. You'll have to excuse me. But you can watch it sort of grow up along the seasons as things change. And you can see that, you know, this kind of meadow approach, these little vignettes that are together here combining. This is like one of my Ozark vignettes. About half of the plants in there all happen to be native to the Ozarks. And I have an in, I'm entranced with the Ozarks flora. And there's different vignettes along the way, different ideas. You see... That's kind of a grown-up shot of the one you saw before, but all this plant material that's kind of overgrown and taking up this in the front is a little corridulus, corridulus sempervirens. It's a little biennial. It recedes profusely, and people always ask if they can have seed, and they're always amazed at how glad I am to give them seed. Um, it's a terrible sales pitch. Now, none of you will want seed. It'll be terrible. Uh, but when they're done blooming, the easiest thing in the world to pull out you can still see them down there on the end, too. And as we fade into summer, once you pull those out, oh, look, there's a diva. Um, pop together by... I clicked back. I don't know how to go back on this one, too. I, I obviously put them beside each other, um, but I don't know. I, this is, I know this is sort of like to be like a macro sort of big idea thing, but if you don't grow Henry Eiler's coneflower, sweet co it's a Rebecca, Rebecca septimentosa Henry Eiler's, you absolutely must. It is one of these, it's, an, it's a diva plant, and I wish I had a shot that showed, it gets about this tall. The petals are quilled, so instead of being sort of rolled out and, and in rays, they're quilled up. Rebecca what? Rebecca subtomentosa. Henry Eilers. It's not on the list because I couldn't fit it in, but I had to put it in here. Henry Eilers Sweet Cone Flower will be the common name. It's excellent for cut flowers. It actually has a sweet smell to it, which is unusual for plants, for Asteraceae plants in this particular group. But you can kind of see certain, I love black foliage sedums too, too. So you can kind of see, you know, and like that shot back there, or this shot here, to me, that's August. To, this is late August and early September. So when I think that, I see this vignette in my garden, too, sort of knit together. And that was Christmas. Um, this is the Henry Eilers Cunflower, incidentally, right here in the front. And that vignette, actually, do you remember the shot that had the flocks in the middle? That's that vignette, same vignette, just a few months later. And if, if somebody ever needs to learn about the change of the seasons, just show them the shot before, <laughs> and then show them this one. 
and label that one summer and this one hell. <laughs> we'll be good. And if serendipity wasn't obvious enough, I, we were pulling out a brick path in the backyard this, this year, and there was a little variegated columbine that had chosen to set Rota in there as well. I have talked for about an hour and ten minutes, and you are not all asleep yet, so that's a good sign, too. We're going to take a little bit of a break, I think, give you a chance to stretch your legs and generate your thoughts, and we'll come back for what I hope will be an exciting 40 minutes or so of discussion. So thank you so much. Remember. It's appropriate uh, that we start with an iris question since we have an iris specialist <laughs> on hand, even though I think his knowledge goes so far beyond that. It's amazing. Um, thank you. This person says... After five years or so, I divided my thriving bearded iris bed. I cleaned and dried the rhizomes in the shaded area. I replanted in the same bed. Now I have, after three years, barely any blooms. What is wrong? Not any iris borers as, you see, not any iris borers or all the, uh, as all the rhizomes are healthy. Any ideas why they wouldn't be blooming? Stump the iris nerd. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this was after three years. Three years. She didn't save the, she didn't save the new bloom. She just planted the old one. Uh -oh. uh -oh. That's, yeah, that's certainly, that was my, my first thought was is I wanted to know what size the rhizomes were that she planted back to. When you divide bearded irises, um, there's kind of an architecture you should be familiar with in that, Bearded irises are rhizomes, and one rhizome that puts up a flower stalk is technically is good for one flower stalk. This is if it's if it's not if it don't think about rebloomers for a minute because that's an exception to the rule. One rhizome is good for one flower stalk, and the reason that they're perennial is because that one flower stalk then after you know after it blooms you know there's little what are called bud primordia at the base of the rhizome. They're like little you know goopy piles of cells that could become new plants if given all the right conditions and love and tender care. So when that flowering, when that, when flowering is finished on that mother rhizome, there is a cascade of processes that happen that break bud on those developing eyes, as they're called, on the rhizome. And that's what forms new plants. That's how irises multiply and form a clump and that sort of thing, too. And different mother rhizomes can vary in their rate of reproduction. Some produce one, which is atypical, that's at the other end. Some are fertile and, and uh, produce nine or more, but the average is probably three to five, I would say, for most irises is kind of that's where the number of increases are. But the problem is, is that when you divide those, if you divide those, like in July, which is when I tend to like to divide because it's when I'm less busy with shipping iris orders and it's a good time to get them nice and established before fall, those bud primordia may not be fully developed yet, and they may not always be visible enough to know that those are new increases. So she, what may have happened, so I'm talking about her as if she's not here, or he, or whoever, but uh, what may have happened is that you know, when, when the person dug this up and uh, uh, went to put these back, is that they actually, what they were tossing away uh, could have actually been mother rhizomes that just hadn't broken bud yet, and to plant those back. So, because um, generally, I mean, division is a good thing. Uh, division, you know, sort of stimulates overall health of the plant and continue, you know, promotes additional flowering and that kind of thing as well, too. So, next. Okay. <laughs> um, what is the biggest mistake gardeners make when designing a new garden? Um, I think the prem I challenge the premise of the question, my dear. Um, I don't know that mistake is a good word. I, I, I don't like this idea that there are paradigms of style and virtue that we shall bow down to on one knee and with right hand in error and say, I shall not do these things because it is a garden and we should not do these things. Sure, there are errors that one can make in garden. I mean, I've gardened, this would... I'm 23 as of two days ago, and I started gardening when I was four, so do the math. And in those many years of gardening, I've watched my grandma make all kinds of mistakes. I've watched myself make all kinds of mistakes or errors in judgment, perhaps, planting something too close to something else and watching it get run over. But is it really a mistake if you could learn something from it and, and make a better garden? So I, I don't know that I have thought too much about the mistakes that we all make, 
and with what regularity we make them too. I, I see all those things as opportunities. So uh, maybe the one mistake that people make is that they're too afraid to try. So, uh, and I think that I think that especially in this day and age when we're talking about wanting to get people my age into gardening, uh, you know, we should encourage experimentation and error um, because it's through which we learn new things. So. For Iowa, for the Iowa City area, now I don't know if this is fair to ask you really because this isn't your area. So, um, but from what you've seen, do you have an idea about <coughs> what zone we would, you would, you would say Iowa City is for the winter? Well, the 1990 USDA hardiness zone map, which is what all of us are familiar with, no doubt, is horrendously out of date. The new version was to be out in 2005, but we've, we're experiencing arguably some amount of climate change and the problem has been is that as they have sat down to look at how these maps are constructed and you may think the hardiness in it's it's an incredibly tedious process by how these maps are put together because there's a lot of industry that depends on the delineation and demarcation of these zones the problem is, is that some data reference points particularly those in the midwest experience so much variance one year to the next that for example, one of the discussions, I, there, I know several people who are on this committee, if you would pick one, one year, and I, we won't choose a year, just, just, just pick a year in the last 15 years of climate data that they're looking at, they've noticed, particularly here in the Midwest, that each year on either side of that data point may vary so much as to change the zone up to a full zone either way. For those of you who have statistical training, you know that that's a giant problem, um, and it makes it really hard to sort of demarcate those boundaries. So that whole spiel being said, most of Iowa is 4B or 5A. The most recent revision of the map that I have seen suggests that most of Iowa would be considered broadly as part of Zone 5, mm -hmm. but the definitions of Zone 5 have changed. The, the sort of, so when you have all this variance to work with, there's the, the easy option is to sort of you know, change the way you structure an individual zone or just change how you define a zone. And so some of these zones are getting, the boundaries are expanded. So the range of minimum temperatures, which is what the map is based off of, are getting bigger to account for some of this up and down nonsense that's happening. So broadly, most of Iowa would be considered zone five. You on the south and east side, if you took a map of Iowa and you went from Keokuk and Burlington all the way up to Sioux City, generally the map is kind of tending from warmer in the southeast part of the state and through kind of as in diagonals up to cooler parts of the state across the top. So um, without yeah. spending a whole hour on hardiness zone maps, that's... <laughs> yeah, good. How about summer? Is there a summer zone for... Well, the, the American Horticultural Society put out, has a map called a heat zone map. And at the top, top of my head, I can't remember, does anybody off the top of my head what Iowa's heat zone is. I want to say it's seven-ish, six-ish, I don't know. It's the, the heat zone map is based off of sort of daily maximum summer temperatures. Um, and it's helpful in some parts of the country. I, well, I think it's helpful everywhere. It's just not been as widely adopted as the hardiness zone map is. And it basically is a way of uh, gauging which plants can sort of tolerate summer because for so long, you know, our mindsets about choosing plants, you know, particularly northern climates are, oh, will it make it through the winter? And the fact is, is that a lot of plants maybe necessarily are, are perfectly hardy if they just can't handle the summer. You know, the sort of this mid-continent, humid, uh, potentially wet summer that we can have, so. Would you mind thinking spring, su early summer, Maybe high late summer, summer, high summer, high summer and fall, autumn. and and could you could you give us your favorite sunny plant and shady plant for each of those times? Let's start with spring. Let's okay. start with spring. Spring. Uh, your spring. Spring's coming, and what are you most excited to see? Irises. Um, <laughs> boy, isn't he predictable? Um, uh, so for sun. Uh, yeah, and, okay, and, then, so and then and then and if you say iris. Can you pick an iris? Sure, I'll do that. Okay. So there are all kinds of irises. There are tons of species. Yeah. And so I always do sun and shade for each mm -hmm. of these. Okay, mm -hmm. so for sun, I'll pick an one eye. I only pick one iris. I could pick an iris for both. But um, for spring and for sun, uh, go with some of the dwarf irises. Um, they're absolutely enchanting. And you're missing a whole new vantage point of the earth if you haven't laid on your stomach and looked at a dwarf iris clump that's this tall in full bloom. So that's sun for spring. Spring for shade. I am a sucker for epimediums. 
uh, the barren words. I see lots of yeses, like there's a mm -hmm. team out here that's rooting for yeah. them. Barren, <laughs> yes, yes. There's all kinds of them. They come in all different colors and shapes and heights and sizes and, and are absolutely perfectly tough plants uh, for, for shade. Summer, full sun. Well, summer is so huge. I have to go back to that Eastern Horseman because I'm just on a shtick about this lately. Um, Eastern Horseman is, is fabulous because it's one of the first bee balms I can enjoy without having to explain why there's silver spots in the foliage. And so for, for, and actually it can tolerate some part shade too, but it's generally a full sun plant. So the Eastern Horseman, summer for shade. I have to go back to that Scutellaria incana that we saw, the hoary skull cap too. I'm just, I'm just absolutely enamored by that plant. I think there are photos of me from that trip next to a plant going like this, but yeah, ma'am. <laughs> it's Eastern Horse Mint. The botanical name is Monarda Bradburyana. You're saying horse man? Horse mint. Horse, horse mint. mint. Sorry. Horse mint. Okay. And is that hoary skull cap you mentioned, is that an annual or a perennial? All these are perennial. Okay. I have a shirt even though I don't actually feel this way, but it's just kind of fun to wear it. I have a shirt with a big petunia on it that has a don't smoke sign over it that says friends don't let friends buy annuals. <laughs> <laughs> it was the cover of the Plant Delights catalog, Plant Delights Nursery, if you know Plant Delights Nursery, in fall of 98, I think. Is the Horace Cap easily available, widely available? No, unfortunately. It's, it's one of these, you know, plants that, you know, the more we talk about it, damn it, the more we'll get some. So it's, it's around. Some native plant nurseries do carry it. Um, but it, it, it will be tough to find. If um, we Google it, if we If you Google it, you should be able to find some sources you know. and things too. Also check out my, my kellydenorris.com. There's a section called Handouts and Downloads, and there's the, the Zoneworthy PowerPoint, and Scuttlearia is in the Zoneworthy PowerPoint, and there's a whole list of like Kelly's, a list of Kelly's favorite nurseries kind of thing there. Yeah. The majority of which of those plants in that talk are found between one of those sources, so that, yeah. if that's helpful. So now we move into, that was early summer, which, so... What kind of make, summer's so big? So late summer, for full sun. Oh, let's pick something creative. Um, that's not too nerdy. Um, let, I, I'm, I'm, I love goldenrods. They don't cause hay fever. Don't give me that. The, the, the pollen grains are totally different. If you snore anything, you will sneeze. But believe me, <laughs> goldenrod pollen. <laughs> goldenrod pollen is not that small. It does not cause hay fever. And we need to grow more goldenrods because they are tough, uh, they're stubborn. And so, I mean, I could choose, I did a whole article on, on goldenrods for Iowa Guardian Magazine, so go pick up a copy of Iowa Guardian and see all those goldenrods. Late summer for shade. Hmm. Hmm. It's one of my favorites. Oh, how could I forget that? Bush clematis. Bush clematis was up in there. Clematis heraclifolia. Um, it, is, it is the August plant. I mean, absolutely incredible. And the amount of variation that's out there is stupendous. My favorite one, which I got from the perennial flower farm several years ago, smells like gardenias. I mean, a clematis that smells like gardenias. It's yeah. weird. But how are you spelling heraclifolia? Heraclifolia. I think it's actually on the handout somewhere because oh, it was oh. in okay. one of those shots. Um, Let's find it. Uh, 39 under vignettes. Clematis heraclifolia. Bush clematis is the common name. So now how is that different from integrifolia? Because that's also a shrub. Great question. Clematis, um, integrifolia, so you know, there are vining clematis and non-vining clematis. And within non-vining clematis, there are those that sort of ramble, which integrifolia kind of does. Heraclifolia is truly kind of almost kind of shrub-like. Uh, it has kind of an open, airy form, but it's, it's stout, though. I mean, some people, some forms are a little lax. All the ones that I grow are fairly stout and kind of shrub-like and, and upright. So kind of a whole different idea on clematis. Um, okay. And so then we get fall. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is a great question. Oh, I don't want to spoil that one yet. You have to stay tuned for that. So <laughs> fall, for, uh, fall for full sun, um, the seven suns flower is blooming in September. Uh, so that's definitely something that appreciates full sun. Do you know, as a random just sidebar, this is sort of underscoring that thing about plantsmanship. You know, if you never try something, you'll never know. Do you know that we're, Heptacodium seven suns flower is actually endangered in the wild. It's known from seven locations in the, across three provinces in China, eastern China, all of which, if you extend sort of the, U, the USDA hardiness zone map around the world, would qualify as zone seven. 
and it's perfectly hardy and does wonderful in zone four here in Iowa. If you never try, you'll never know. So um, shade for fall. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Um, I love to stick, I mean, you know, I'm going back to the plants we've sort of seen, you know, to kind of reinforce some points. The culchicums can, you know, really go in a lot of different places. There's several different kinds. There's actually, culchicums are not true crocus, actually. Um, there are fall blooming crocuses, uh, things like saffron crocus, uh, which are marginally hardy here. I've had mixed success with them over the years. Um, and, you know, by the time the leaves are, I mean, some of these aren't blooming until maybe the leaves are falling. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, kind of changes the idea a little bit because you're planting them in shade, but they're really blooming when there's a little more light there in that, in that instance there too. Have I fulfilled my obligation I to that question? I think you've done a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful okay. job. Going back to the autumn crocus, mm -hmm. um, is that just, do you plant a bulb just like you do for the spring crocus? Or yeah, what they're is it? crocuses are technically corms. Crocuses are in the uh, okay. iris family, by the way. Uh -huh. um, and uh, they're technically corms. Uh, okay. So, and they're really, if you've never planted them before, they're the weirdest, they're alien looking. They're, they're kind of, a corm is sort of a flattened stem that looks like a bulb for intensive, all intents and purposes. But it has several, it will have several buds out of it. And so a, a, a culchicum, I need to take a photo of that, has several like horns, which are the flower buds. So when you actually plant the culchicums in the fall, if you've gotten them from a reputable source, you could plant them and as soon as maybe a week later actually see them bloom because they're trying to bloom in the fall at the same time that you're planting them. Now, when you plant fall crocus, you know, they'll come up, they'll bloom, they'll do their thing, and you'll forget about them, and Christmas happens, and you come out in the spring, and the garden's there, and you see this weird-looking foliage. It's kind of thick, and it's shiny, and you think, oh, what is that? And then it just disappears, and you think, oh, well. And then all of a sudden, the fall crocus come rushing back, and that's, their foliage comes up in the spring. It lasts through maybe the first or second week in June, and then it, it very quickly disappears. Um, it just kind of senesces and... Uh, says bye-bye, uh, and, and then, you know, these sort of leafless flowers come back in the, in the fall, too. So if you haven't tried Colchicum, you really should. There's How are you spelling Colchicum? Colchicum, it should be on here, I think. See, it's I don't have one of those. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to... What was that? 31. 31, 30, so, they say. Okay. okay. Yep. So it's a C or K? Mm-hmm. C. Okay. Okay, there are a couple on bittersweet. Uh, mm. You know, how do you get bittersweet? Do you need to fertilize it? And uh, does it need shade or sun? And how big does it get? And, and this okay, well, if I'm going to talk about bittersweet, I do have to make the qualification that you know, there are two species, scandens and orbiculatus. I shall grow only scandens and not orbiculatus. Orbiculatus is bad. It's, uh, it's incredibly invasive. But it has far more attractive fruit displays overall than what Scandens does, and that's why people who make wreaths and do sort of outdoorsy crafts prefer Orbiculatus, and that's how it's got to be a problem in this country, is because people take these wreaths home, and the orange parts that we get all excited about are the fruits, and then they let their wreath fall apart, and they just toss it away, and it, you know, all is well. Not. Um, and, and that's what creates it to be a problem. Now, there's a lot of people who, who, who are sort of like, I won't even plant bittersweet because I can't tell them apart. Um, and there are some people who say that they've hybridized and... Um, there's little evidence for most of this. They're, they're tough to tell apart, but the fruiting structures are very different. Um, orbiculatus, so, you know, picture of what you see as a bittersweet or like that slide. Our native bittersweet, all the fruit is held at the end of the stem. You'll have a nice, long, sort of flowing stem and fruit. Orbiculatus, all the fruit, all the flowers, and then following the fruit, are born in the axles between leaves and other stems. So you get this, which makes them great for weaving because then you have this whole stem that's got all these berries on it that can be weaved together. So if you see fruit hanging at the end of a stem, it's okay. If you see fruit all up and down the stem, it's not cool. From a growing standpoint, um, sun to part shade, they're tough. I mean, you know, the scandens that you find in the wild are growing in some fence row where they've been blasted by Roundup, probably, and they're just, they're happy as larks. Um, another one of those sort of abuse-tolerant or loving plants. Um, I wouldn't fertilize them, per se. Um, and, and, a lot of, and it's tough because a lot of native plant nurseries have just sort of gone, eh, salastrous or bittersweet. We just, you know, the, and so there, it's, it's actually becoming a little tough to find in some places, too. But, you know, make sure that you get the native one and not the, the Japanese bittersweet. Okay. How tall does golden comfrey get? Oh, that's a great question. Um, that pr there's several variegated cultivars. That cultivar is called Axminster Gold. And Axminster Gold will get, pro the leaves alone, I mean, the flowers are inconsequential, will 
you know, a full clump like this will easily fill out and maybe be upwards of 30 inches tall just in sheer foliar mass. Um, and I've seen them taller in the south, but never that tall in the north necessarily. But they're long lived. I mean, you, can, you saw how fast that one in that slide, I told you that story about how quickly it grew. Um, they're hard to propagate, though. That's the only problem. And so that, that's why they're, they're kind of rare like that, too. But they're great, great plant, texture, color all around. Okay. And you said they were shade. Yeah, put that, in, put that in part shade to full shade. That, in th that one in my yard is in full shade. Yay. A light bulb for shade. Is uh, Taylor's. Sunburst, Pinus, Hardy, this far north. That particular shot was taken at the Bickle Hopped. So, yeah. so far so good, I would say. Okay, and good. I think Gary's got one in his yard, if I remember right, or somebody up that way does. Okay. They're around, yeah. Um, do you have a slick way to control iris borer? Yeah. Yes. Um, if you live in town and have city fire ordinances, this is not going to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a lead up to a bad joke either. It's. Uh, um, we burn our irises, and, and actually it will start in about two weeks. I've already made all the appropriate calls to the sheriff's office that the iris farm will not be, will be on fire, but for the right reasons. Um, and what you can do is, is fire at this time of year, before that, oh, those iris clumps are, you know, before the foliage is really of any significant height whatsoever, that burning, you know, removes all the dead leaf matter that shouldn't be around the clumps to promote good health and well-being. And we'll remove any boar eggs or larvae that have found their way there. And you should be in good shape. Now, this is a prevention method. Um, prevention, once you have iris borers, it can be a little difficult to get rid of them. Um, but prevention is the best, best way to do that. If you can't burn your iris clumps, keep the debris away, keep them clean, keep all of that you know, leaf matter, mulch, whatever, don't let it pile up on top of the clump or really in its surrounding areas. You can have irises in mulch beds, but just leave a space of mulch around those clumps to give them some breathing room. We're, we're just not far enough west. Do you know that the iris borer is the larval form of a moth whose western range stops about eastern Nebraska? If you retire to the west coast, you will leave borers behind because that's not where the moth is native to. Um, and so I need, and if someone asked for a picture yesterday, and I'm going to do this this spring if I find one. We, I have trouble finding them because we burn the whole field. There's not a, come to your garden, Diane, okay. <laughs> They're just a little brown, nondescript moth, and she lays her eggs at the base of those clumps where it's nice and, you know, leafy and littery, and she can get in there and, and lay those eggs, and then those eggs o overwinter, and then they hatch about now, and they're hungry, and they eat one thing irises and that's and so by the time you often know that you have an infestation those borers are probably long gone so prevention is and there aren't any good insecticides still on the market the best one was taken off the market a couple of years ago for labeling issues so um, prevention is is the the best best thing is Clorox water doing yeah anything? well that's again sort of an after I mean borers are these grimy grubby little disgusting creatures that carry bacteria on their body which is ubiquitous in the soil. And so one of the symptoms, which is really kind of an after effect of, of the borer, is soft rot, which will happen to about any, I mean, the kind of soft rot that you'd get on any kind of herbaceous perennial during a really, really wet year, it's the same kind of, same family of bacteria because they're, they're ubiquitous, they're all over the place. Um, and so once you have rot, rot's perfectly treatable if you catch it in time. You can dig up the clumps, trim them back, and you know, shake the dirt off and throw them into a bucket of 50-50 bleach and water. Or, if you're a little eccentric, like yours truly, you can walk out with a jug of Clorox and pour it straight onto the clump, and it'll be fine. No joke. No joke. We had a terrible, terrible problem with rot last year with all the rain that we had. Several, one of our trial beds, the median trial bed, is up on top of a hill where there is no drainage. So it just ponds and puddles. And so we had all kinds of rot breaking out. It was driving drive me crazy. And so <clears throat> I told, had one of my people, I said, go get me a case of Clorox bleach at the grocery store. And we're going to go bleach the place and pour, apply it directly to the, I mean, you know, don't wing it around, but I mean, you know, try and directly apply it to where you, at the base of the, the rhizomes, uh, the crown where you see it, and uh, you'll be in good shape. Good. Okay. This is yes. back. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Uh-huh. Those little brown 
things. How hmm. long do they survive? It's been four years. <coughs> Can you repeat the question if you can? Yeah, she was, she was asking, she had this traffic stopping clump of irises and they got borers and so they just did away with the clump and now when they dig in that area they're still seeing signs of, the, of these sort of, you know, grubs. Without seeing them, I wouldn't be able to confirm whether they're actually iris borers or not. Iris... No, 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 it's that brown... Okay. So they're very small, I mean... Yeah, um, I mean... I would have to see them to know whether they're iris borers or not, I guess is what I'm saying. The iris borers are very small, and those larvae won't live without a food source. And unless there's something around, I mean, that moth has several host species. Um, you'll occasionally, there have been reports on the East Coast have seen them in daylilies, actually. But they're not really, you know, not, there's not a coevolution with daylilies there to sort of, uh, you know, support those larvae for very long. So I, I, I guess my overall question is I don't know why they would still be around without much of a food source or something. Well, you're, I think you're talking about an overwintering structure for a moth or a butterfly, like, like a chrysalis is. These are larvae. These are actually sort of, you know, grub-like organisms that are kind of worm-like that would be in the... So I, I wouldn't know without, without being able to see them or looking closer. So sorry, I can't answer that for you. Back to your burning. Sure. This person wants to know um, when and how often you would recommend burning, uh, like for burning a prairie, and if you think fall burning is okay. There is literature that supports that fall burning isn't a bad idea. Um, <clears throat> I did a lot of prayer restoration work when I was a kid in high school. Um, I still say that March is to every season we burn, burn, burn. Um, and so, uh, you know, spring is, uh, you know, if you consider, you know, go back in time and consider when fire typically happened in the calendar year in the prairie environment too, they were most often happening. Um, at a couple of times a year. There would be the occasional summer fire that would be caused by, you know, sort of a thunderstorm thing, a thunderstorm event which would happen in the, in the um, uh, summer or maybe into the fall. Um, and then there were, you know, there were spring fires too. There was a lot of tinder out there. I mean, a lot of sort of, you know, carryover debris from the previous years, um, potentially a lot of wind uh, early in the spring. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not a prairie reconstructionist or an expert in prairie ecology necessarily, so I, I'm hesitant to say a lot more than that too. Certainly the, the, uh, the standard is to burn in March or the spring. Okay. This person says, even though I watch <coughs> the day length, I can't get my onions to bulb. Any suggestions? Talk to Hank Tabor at Iowa State. I don't do vegetables. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's good. I'm an ornamental horticulturist. It feeds my, if it feeds my soul, we're good, but I'll, I'll go to a farmer's market and support somebody who knows how to grow vegetables. So. Okay. And, and, and do you have any, this is the last one, do you have any wisdom as far as Japanese beetles on roses? Well, we could stop right after, do I have any wisdom? The answer would be no, <laughs> but the, on Japanese beetles on roses, um, you could just not plant roses, but, um, <laughs> sorry, um, there, I, I personally, uh, you, know, you know, Japanese beetles are a tough problem and, uh, you know, there's, there's no magic answer for how to deal with Japanese beetles, unfortunately. Um, and, and they're very non, they're, they're non-discriminate in what they like to eat. So, I mean, they're yeah. kind of a little, so I, yeah. no, not a great question to it's end okay. on. <laughs> I think if we're going to do a door prize, we better do it now. Diane? Yeah. Diane and, and Cindy, come on. I want you to know that these two women are the co-chairs of the Project Green Steering Committee and they work their tails off for this organization. It's true. It's true. Oh.